we get in there. We are, um, it's that wonderful time of year when Jim's zeal for the Exodus takes him to his highest point, when he takes a portion of the congregation out into the wilderness for four days, not 40, but four. So thank you for this half of the room for being faithful and coming here today. And for my refugees over here, (laughs) thank you for coming as well. Um, In the garden, Adam and Eve, uh, the main temptation that Satan brought, right? It wasn't to outright disobey God. It wasn't to kill. It wasn't to lie. The, The method that Satan used was simply getting them to doubt the word of God. And the moment they took that first step, the moment they made that first small compromise, that's when everything else cascaded. That's when sin and death came into the world. Just simply doubting the word of God. But let's, uh, let's take a moment and pray. Holy Father, we just ask, Lord God, that you would be with uh, Pastor Jim and those who are uh, with him, Lord, up at Big Lake. Keep them safe, Lord. Um, may they be glorified, and uh, may you be glorified, Lord, and may they be edified in the message, that, Lord, that you give them there. And may that be true of us here as well, Lord. May you be all that comes from this vessel. Um, I ask and pray in the name of your great Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, I want to talk this morning, kind of we're going to do kind of a bird's eye overview. We're going to kind of not look at one particular passage of scripture, but several. For the purposes, I I want to show you the kind of the shadows of the Old Testament, particularly how it relates to Jesus. Where do we see Jesus in the Old Testament? Now, in the second century, um, in around the mid-100s, there was uh, a man by the name of Marcion. Okay, Marcion was... For all intents and purposes, he was apostate. He was a heretic. He was a blasphemer. Um, He was basically preaching that um, we didn't need the Old Testament, that Christians did not need the Old Testament. In fact, they didn't even need the New Testament except for the book of Luke and Paul's epistles. So forget the other three Gospels. Forget Revelation, Peter, Hebrew, James. Forget them all. All we need are just Paul's letters and, and Luke. And that's it. And there's really nothing new about that. As far as, now the Christians of his time, the church fathers, they wrote and publicly denounced him and his heresy, which will forever be called Marcionism, um, lived on. Where you have Christians down through the centuries who tell you, you don't need the Old Testament. Um, Some of the more well-known preachers today have, have said things to the effect of we can unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. All we need is the New Testament. Well, what gets quoted in the New Testament? The Old Testament, right? As one pastor put it, the, uh, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. You've heard this before. The Old Testament is being revealed in the New Testament. Okay? If it wasn't for the um, Old Testament, we wouldn't even know what we were being saved from or what sin is or why we need a Savior. The Old Testament is so important. And I want to go through the Old Testament today. Um, why? Because Jesus is in it. Right? As we just read a moment ago, after his resurrection on the road with the two men's with the two men on the road to Emmaus. Um, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted uh, to them all the scriptures and the things concerning themselves. Um, In another place in John, he says, speaking to the Pharisees, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. Yet these very scriptures, these are the very scriptures that testify about Jesus. He's not talking about the New Testament because there was no New Testament when Jesus said those things. He is clearly referring to the Old Testament. 
when the Bereans searched the scriptures diligently, they were looking in the Old Testament. And so my question is, what were they looking at? What was Jesus referring to? Um, we could be here for hours and hours going through all those things. We are not. Um, only gonna, but we are going to do kind of a bird's eye view of things. So um, with that said, we, we kind of need to define two terms. One is typology, and the other is Christophany. Okay? We'll do typology first, and then we'll do some Christophany at the end. Um, typology is very simple. It is a special kind of symbolism, from, usually from the Old Testament, that foreshadows a pattern or an event or an action that is being taken by Jesus. So if, as a quick example, one you know, very familiar to you, um, in, during the time of the Passover, they put the blood over the wooden post of the door, right? And so their house was protected from the wrath of God by being covered in the blood. It's a very simple New Testament metaphor. If we want to escape the judgment and wrath of God, we need to be covered in the blood of the Lamb. Simple enough. Uh, Christophany is very simply when Jesus shows up in the Old Testament before he's born. Obviously, he's born in the New Testament, but any time that Jesus shows up before that in the Old Testament, that's a big fancy word for Christophany. Sometimes it's also called a theophany. Theo is just Greek for God. So when God shows up in physical form, very simply, God in physical form, is that not Jesus? Right? Is that not Jesus? So some of these examples will be familiar to you. Some of them may not be, and that's okay. Um, but I want to go through everything as quickly as we can, but just to paint a picture for you that Jesus is alive and well in the Old Testament long before Mary was ever born, and that's why he's God. So let's go over some examples. In Genesis 3, everything always starts with Genesis 3, right, guys? All of it. <laughs> My men Bible study, shout out. Um, that famous passage of Genesis 3.15 said, I will put enmity, war, between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will crush your head, and you will bruise his heel. That's the first prophecy we get in the Bible, that a Messiah figure is going to come and crush the head of the serpent, crush the head of Satan. Well, have you ever stopped and think about, where did Jesus die? Where, I mean, like, sincerely, where did he die? I'm asking. Someone shout out the answer. Where was he crucified? He's, cru he's crucified on Calvary, right? Isn't that the word Calvary, Golgotha? Isn't that called the skull? Okay, whether Golgotha, Aramaic, Calvary, Latin. He's crucified on the place called the skull. Um, here's an old picture with kind of 2,000 years of erosion. This picture was taken um, in, in the early 1900s. Unfortunately, it's kind of been built over today in Israel, but you can still kind of see the outline of the skull, despite the uh, erosion of century and time. The Son of God was revealed to this world in order to destroy the devil's work, John tells us. And at a place called the skull, head, Satan's power is crushed. So God um, has a great sense of irony in this, right? So Jesus, being crucified on a place called the skull, crushes the head, the power of Satan, defeating sin and death at the cross. It's a really cool typology. What about Noah? Okay. Noah's family, you know the story, he built an ark out of wood. It's coated with tar or pitch or bitmen, depending on your translation. Um, God protected that family, right? He shuts the door. Once they're in, God closes the door. So nobody inside can come out and nobody outside can come in. And then he proceeds to judge the world with a flood. And finally, after about a year, the waters are coming down and that, that ship rests, the ark rests on Mount Ararat. Now the Hebrew word for tar or pitch is the same Hebrew word for atonement. And the word rest, in Hebrew, is the word Noah. So you have a guy named Noah, who his, his ship, Noah's, using Noah as a verb, Noah's, it rests on the mountain. 
And the Hebrew word for Ararat means curse. So think about this. Here's a wooden structure covered in atonement that rests on a mountain of curse. Jesus is our ark. There's one way in to be saved. One way. And in Jesus, he is our atonement, right? From the curse of sin. And he did this on a mountain. You see in the parallels. You see in the typology. Jesus is the ark. There's one way in. He brings atonement. The ark itself was covered in pitch, which is atonement. Same word. And on the mountain of curse, Noah's family finds rest. On, the, on another mountain, Jesus brings us atonement from the curse by becoming the curse so that we can have rest. And Jesus, as he says famously in Revelation, doors that he opens, no one can close, and doors that he closes, no one can open. Just like the ark. That's why Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And again, in John, he says, I am the door. Anyone that enters through me will be saved. Just like on the ark, anyone who came in through that door, all eight of them were saved. The ark is a typology of Christ. Um, What about Melchizedek, right? Melchizedek, he's a priest and a king. Um, His name, Melchizedek itself, means he's the king of righteousness. He lived in the city of Salem, which would eventually become Jerusalem. Okay? Salem means peace, so he's the king of peace. He has those titles. King of peace, king of righteousness. And then he shows up to Abraham and he gives him bread and wine. And he blesses Abraham. I think the typology should be fairly clear, right? Here's Jesus, the true king of peace, prince of peace, lord of lords, right? The true king of righteousness who gives us his body and his blood, which he likened to the bread and the wine as a symbol of a new covenant. So what you see there back in Genesis 14 with Melchizedek is a shadow. It is a type of Christ. In fact, there are some who even argue that Melchizedek might have even been Christ himself. Don't know if that's true or not, but some people try to make that argument. But the typology is certainly there. I mean, if someone came to you and gave you bread and wine, would you give them a tenth of everything you own? And Abraham was like a millionaire in his day. So, I mean, that that seems like a pretty good trade. Speaking of Abraham... Very, very well-known story, right? Abraham and his son and two servants, they journey for three days. He has his son carry the wood up a hill next to Moriah. In, In Abraham's day, it was called Moriah. By David's day, that mountain changed its name to Zion. Same mountain, though, Moriah, Zion. And on that mountain, he offers his son as a sacrifice to God. But at the last minute, you know, God provides a ram. Its thorns, excuse me, the horns of the ram got caught in a thicket, a thorn bush. And Abraham goes and takes the ram, and he slaughters it, and he sacrifices it as a substitute sacrifice instead of his son. Do you see the typologies? Right? God has his son wearing a crown of thorns, on his head, just like how the ram had his horns, i.e. his head, stuck in a crown of thorns, in thorns, excuse me. The Son of God is wearing a crown of thorns, carrying a piece of wood up a hill right next to, right next to Mount Zion, Calvary. Okay? Moriah and Zion, again, being the same. And there, Jesus, the Lamb of God, gave his life as a substitute sacrifice And he remained dead for three days until he rose again. Um, 
There are dozens and dozens of little cool things like that in that story in Genesis 22 where you can compare Isaac and Jesus. I mean, these are just kind of like the top four or five. Um, But read that chapter sometime and look for all the different connections. It's truly amazing. It it truly is. Um, Jacob, right? He had a vision of angels ascending and descending on a ladder or a stairway, call it what you want, from heaven to earth and back again. And so when he wakes up from that dream, he calls that place Bethel, which means house of God in Genesis 28. Jesus, in his conversation um, with Nathanael, when he's recruiting Nathanael, he says to Nathanael, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So that thing that Jacob saw that connected heaven to earth, that thing that brings God down to earth and the things on earth up to God, that thing that the angels travel on, that stairway to heaven, as it were, ladder up to heaven, that is Jesus. Jesus is the thing that connects man to God, heaven to earth. He is that connection. It's why we, are, we cannot get to heaven unless it is through him, because he is the one and only connection that we have. He is that thing which, which Jacob saw, represented in his dream as a ladder. That's Jesus. That's just not some theologian's interpretation. That's Jesus' interpretation in John 1. Um, one of my favorite ones, I'm sure Pastor Jim's too, <laughs> it deals with Exodus, right? Uh, an Egyptian king orders the killing of all the Hebrew male newborns in Egypt, right? Baby Moses is hidden by his family, and he's raised by an Egyptian princess. Literally in the house of the guy who ordered all the baby's executions is hiding the one who, who would one day lead all of the Israelites out of Egypt. Mary and Joseph, you, you probably saw the comparison yourself many a Christmas times, right? After King Herod orders the death of all the Jewish babies two years and younger, They leave Bethlehem, and they go to Egypt to hide. So you have a king who wants to kill Jewish infants, and both in the cases of Moses and Jesus, they hide somewhere in Egypt until the time has passed. Like The comparisons are are amazing. Um, As we said earlier, well-known, probably the most common typology used as examples, the Passover lamb, right? Putting the blood of the lamb over the door and the lentil so that God's judgment would not come to you upon your house, he says in Exodus 12. And we need the blood of Jesus, the, the amazing, powerful, forgiving of sin blood of Jesus. As Paul put it best in Romans 5, 9, Therefore, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from wrath through him? You have to remember, my friends, that you were saved from God, by God, for God. Okay? You were saved from his wrath, by the blood of his Son, for an eternal inheritance in the kingdom of God forever. You were saved from him, by him, for him. It's a weighty thing to think about. But without the blood, we don't have a chance. If you were there that day in Calvary, when they were crucifying him, would you try and take him down? Would you try to stop it? I hope that it would break your heart, but I hope the answer would be no. Because if he's not on that cross, what chance do you and I have? We have no chance unless he's on there. We need his blood. Um, (laughs) This one's kind of fun. This one's kind of small. It's very easy to miss 
but it's very, it's very interesting. It's one of those passages in the Bible that when you read it on its face, you get really bored really quickly because it's a lot of names and numbers. Um, and I gave you just a small portion of what it might look like, right? Um, when, while, while Israel is wandering through the desert for, for those 40 years, God gave Israel specific directions about how they were supposed to camp. So the tabernacle would always be in the middle. That was the portable tent of meeting, the portable temple. Um, And it went something like this, right? The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, The people of Israel shall camp by their own standards with their banners of their father's house. The camp shall uh, be facing the tent of meeting on every side. Those who camp on the east side of the sunrise shall camp by the standards of Judah, blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to read it all, don't worry. (laughs) Um, But that's just the the east side and the south side. I didn't have enough room to paste the north or the south side. It's a very long chapter, and all it is is just a description of how you're supposed to camp. And you're like, this is boring. Yes, it is. But when you realize how they camp, when you realize if you could get in a, a, on a, air, a helicopter or get a drone or go up onto a mountain, when you look down, you would see the arrangement of the camp like a giant cross. So this kind of passage is kind of not that exciting to read, but if you were there looking at it for yourself, you would see over a million people camped and arranged like a giant cross. And that one, that cross is what wandered around the desert for 40 years. And God was in the center of it in that temple. That would be pretty cool to see. If you've been to like the football games or seen them on uh, TV with the college games where the bands all kind of move around, the marching bands always make these cool formations. Um, they're really neat to watch. They're really fun as you get hundreds or thousands of marching band people all moving in unison to make these cool shapes and patterns. Um, I, I imagine it had to be something like that. But now you have over a million people camped together like a cross. And that is amazing. So when God is looking down at his children of Israel for 40 years, all he sees is a cross. Okay. Um, the story of Moses in the desert in Numbers. When they were rebelling, God sent serpents. And they were bit. And they were dying. And they were suffering. And God told Moses to make a pole, a bronze pole in the shape of a serpent coiled around it and lifted up and every Israelite who looked at it would be healed. It's such a weird story. In fact, 700 years later, in the time of King Hezekiah, uh, Israelites were worshipping that snake staff that Moses had made as an idol. So Hezekiah destroyed it. So that's the question, right? Why, Why does Jesus in this verse here in John 3, in this famous famous conversation with Nicodemus, right before the famous John 3, 16, why does he reference that part of Moses, right? Why does he say, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man will be lifted up, and everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Why does Jesus use the symbol of death and Satan and uh, the fall and sin, why does he use this symbol of the serpent in reference to himself? I thought that's what he came to defeat. And the answer is, yes, he did. He did come to defeat it. Because on that cross, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, on that cross, he who knew no sin became our sin that we may become the righteousness of God. And again, Paul later says in Galatians chapter 3, um, he became the curse by hanging on that tree. Because the curse is anyone who hangs on the, cre- on the tree, Paul says, in order to save us. He became sin, and he suffered death, the, the death that you and I should have died, the wrath of God that you and I should have had. And just like that pole that Moses lifted up, anyone who looks to it was healed. Anyone who looks to Christ can be healed from their sins, can be saved.
And so that's why Jesus makes that comparison between that thing that Moses made that symbolizes all the, the terribleness of Genesis 3, and he turns it into something beautiful. Basically, God does what he always does. He takes what the, evil, what the enemy meant for evil, and he turns it into good. He takes ashes, and he turns them into beauty. That is what God has done time and time and time again in your lives. I'm sure you all have examples of moments where God took bad things that had happened to you, and he has redeemed them for good. He is redeeming them for good. He will be redeeming them for good. And the ultimate example is his son on that cross, becoming sin, becoming our sin, becoming our curse. Um, another great example is Jonah. Right? Jesus tells us in Matthew 12, just as Jonah was in the belly of that fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and for three nights. Jesus uses this typology. If you go back and you read Jonah 2, it's very, I think even in the English translation, it's pretty clear that Jonah probably died. He talks about seaweed being wrapped around him. He talks about Sheol and death coming to get him. Like, him be, I think he died. And him being dead in that fish for a few days and then God bringing him back to life, that would be amazing. Can't say that 100%, but I think there's enough there in, 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 in Jonah chapter 2 to implicate Jonah might have died. At least imply it to some degree. And God brings him back. And he comes back up. Now when Jesus came up out of the grave on day 3, it was in power and glory and awesomeness. Jonah was not quite as dignified fish vomit all over the place. <sighs> but he smelled terrible. Um, but he still came up, and Jesus uses that as a typology. It says, he was down there for three days, I'll be down there for three days, and just like Jonah, on the third day, I will come back up. Um, this one's kind of small. It's very easy to skip past this one, particularly most people don't really spend much time in Leviticus. Um, but in Leviticus, it has this really cool verse. It says that if you are going to bring an offering, particularly of a flock, a sheep or a goat, um, you are to bring a male without blemish, um, and you shall kill it, or the priest will kill it, on the north side of the altar before the Lord. And Aaron's sons should throw the blood against the side of the altar, Leviticus 1. So you are to take the lamb, and it is to be sacrificed on the north side of the altar, on the north side of the temple. Here's a fun quiz for you. On what side of the city do you think Jesus was crucified on? Indeed. Um, not If you go to Jerusalem today, you have the Roman Catholic traditional site of where Jesus was crucified, where he wasn't crucified, but that's what tradition said. Anyways, if you go to the place of Golgotha, which is the picture that I showed you earlier, where you can actually see the, still the, at least the eroded remains of that skull on the side of a mountain, that's where Jesus was, was crucified. It's called Gordon's tomb site. Um, and it is on the north side of the city of where the temple would have been. So just as in the Old Testament, those lambs were sacrificed on the north side of the altar, so Jesus also was sacrificed on the north side of the altar, outside of the community, outside of the city, which in John 19, he tells us plainly that um, the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. Not in the city, but near the city just outside the city, to be more specific, on the north side. So even small little details like that do not escape God's notice. The, in fact, just the entire Old Testament system of it itself, the temple, the animal sacrifices, the atoning for sin, all of that is shadows and typology pointing to Christ. Whether it was Moses' tabernacle, whether it was Solomon's temple or the second temple, Hebrews 10 tells us all of that was just pointing to Jesus and the sacrifice he made on the cross. It just helps us appreciate it better. One of my favorite, I don't even know if this is necessarily typology, 
but I think this is the coolest thing. Uh, is genealogy, right? If you know the genealogy of uh, Adam down to Noah, ten generations, and you look up the meaning of their names, right? Adam is man, Seth is appointed, Enosh is mortal, Kenan is sorrow, Mahalael is the blessed God, Jared means shall come down, Enoch means teaching or preaching, Methuselah means his death shall bring, Methuselah died the year of the flood, the thing that came the year Methuselah died was Noah's flood. Um, Lamech means despairing, and Noah, like we said earlier, means rest or comfort. When you put all of that together, the names of those ten men, from Adam down to Noah, you have as, in the Old Testament, you have as good a summary of the gospel as you see anywhere else in the Bible. Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down preaching or teaching that his death shall bring the despairing rest. His death shall bring us rest. Now, when those parents were naming their sons mortal and sorrow, I don't know, for those of you who have children, did you ever look at your child when they were born and think, hmm, we should name this child sorrow? Or, you know, this child looks pretty weak. Let's, let's call him despairing. I don't think your child would want to go through school, public school today, being called despairing would not go well for him or her. But yet, prophetically, these names spell out the gospel. God knew exactly what he was doing, from Adam down to Noah. And if you keep following the genealogies all the way down to Jesus and Matthew and in Luke, you can do that. You get some really cool things, but we don't have time for that today. But here in the Old Testament, you can see the typology of what is the gospel hidden in just the names of those men. What about Christophanes? God appearing in physical form. Jesus showing up in the Old Testament before he was born. Right? Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the day. Well, if God walked, by implication, he had legs. And if he had legs, he had a body. And if, he had a, and if God is in a body, I call that Jesus. Right? Three strangers who show up, uh, Jesus and the two angels who show up, they visit Abraham. They talk about Sarah's pregnancy that will be occurring, 90-year-old Sarah's pregnancy that will be occurring a year from now. And the soon-to-be destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 18. It's very clear in Genesis 18 and 19 that the the two are angels, but the one guy is God. He calls him the Lord. He calls him the angel of the Lord. It's Jesus. Jacob, he wrestles with God. And again, God in a physical form. Jesus, in Genesis 32, he wants a blessing from him. And by by the end of that next morning, Jesus changes his name to Israel. And Jacob totally freaks out because he realizes he had been wrestling with God all night. He's like, I saw God and I didn't die. Amazing. Um, Moses, he encounters at the burning bush, right? He encounters the I am. Well, God doesn't appear in physical form. He's in the bush, but he still identifies himself as I am. In the New Testament, why did they try to kill Jesus so many times? Why did they try to throw him off of a cliff in his hometown? Why did they try to stone him on two separate occasions? Because he calls himself the I Am. And in Revelation, he calls himself the I Am. He uses the name of God, Yahweh. Okay? He calls himself Yahweh. Y-H-W-H, the Tetragrammaton. In English, I Am. Or capital L-O-R-D in most of our Bibles. That's the name that Jesus refers to himself as. And that's the name that identified himself in Genesis or in Exodus 3. So who's Moses talking to in the bush? He's talking to Christ. Um, what has to be the most awkward lunch of all time in the Bible? Moses, Aaron, and the 70 elders, basically the whole leadership, go halfway up Mount Sinai in um, Exodus 24. And while they're up there, they're having lunch with, with God. God shows up in physical form, and it's so terrifying for them because literally the ground beneath God's feet is turning like blue crystals. 
Imagine God showing up and the carpet just turning into blue crystal. Okay? Um, like lapis luzi, luzi, whatever it's called. Um, that had to be the most terrifying lunch. Could you imagine trying to drink your water and eat your sandwich, and the guy sitting across from you is glowing, and his feet are making the ground around him turn blue? That would be a, be a very trembling lunch. I don't know about you. Um, Joshua and the Israelites, right before the Battle of Jericho, um, the commander of the Lord's host shows up. So in other words, the commander, the commander of angel armies. Who commands angel armies? Because when Joshua sees him, the commander says, take off your sandals, you're on holy ground. Now, we know from other parts of scripture, whenever a human tries to worship a good angel, the good angel always stops them from worshiping. And says, no, no, don't worship me, worship God. But that did not happen here. This wasn't Michael or some other angel. Because as Joshua and the others are bowing down and worshiping, he doesn't stop it. The commander of God's angels' armies who is happy to receive worship. It's Jesus. And that's what Lapis Luzi looks like, in case you're wondering. Blue crystal. At least the earthly version. I don't know if the heavenly version is any better. I'm sure that it is. Um, We go to another example in Judges 6. Gideon. He's called by Christ to lead an army against Israel's enemies. Um, Gideon makes an offering to God. And Jesus is there, he touches it with his staff, this piece of meat, and the whole thing just catches fire. Fire just out of nowhere consumes it. And then later Gideon again realizes, oh my goodness, I saw God and didn't die. And he's shocked by it. Same thing with Samson's parents. Twice, God appears in physical form. And Jesus shows up and tells them all about Samson's life that he'll be a Nazarite, he's never to drink alcohol, he's going to grow his hair, all of that in Judges 13. Again, his parents say, we saw God and did not die. Amazing. Twice. Jesus in physical form. Um, Hagar, one of the coolest stories in the whole Bible, I think. God shows up and says to her, Hagar, Hagar, I see you. What an amazing thing to hear from the mouth of Jesus. I see you in your suffering, in your affliction, in your pain, in the difficulties you're going through, and you and your child, Ishmael, shall not die because I see you. And he blesses her in Genesis 16. Um, in Zechariah 3, one of the minor prophets, not the Joshua of Moses is Joshua, but a thousand years later, there's a high priest by the name of Joshua And in this vision, Zechariah sees this high priest named Joshua, and Satan is there, and he's accusing him. And Jesus shows up, and some angels are with him. And Jesus appears, and he cleanses the high priest. He takes off his filthy robes, and they have him put on clean, pure, royal robes so that he may work in the temple. It's an amazing story there in Zechariah 3. You um, should check it out sometime. And two of my most favorite ones, the third guy, excuse me, the fourth guy, fourth guy, in the fire. Maybe it was an angel, could be, but Nebuchadnezzar says, look, one like the Son of God, in the fire with them. So protected were those three boys that when they came out, not one hair on their body was singed, and they didn't even smell like smoke. Their clothes didn't even smell like smoke. That's how protected they were. And in Daniel 7, Daniel has a vision, and he sees the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, setting up a kingdom that never ends. Very clearly, it is Jesus. And so we come back to our conversation where we started with the boys on the road to Emmaus. And Jesus says to them, guys, all of the typologies, all of the Christophanies, all of the prophecies that I didn't even talk about, we're not even, we didn't even mention 
Isaiah 53 and Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 9 and the virgin shall conceive and give birth and his name will be Emmanuel. We didn't talk about, oh, he'll be born in Bethlehem. We didn't talk about all the prophecies that appear in the scripture about Jesus. Hundreds and hundreds of prophecies in typologies, in Christophanies. The entire Old Testament is about Jesus. It all points to Jesus. So you can kind of understand Jesus' frustration here when he says, how foolish you are. How slow to believe all the things that the prophets have spoken. Did the Messiah have to suffer these things? Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things? And then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. He took them through such an amazing Bible study that by the time they reached with their destination, we find, we're told later, their hearts were burning inside them. May that be true of us. May we be like the men on the road to Emmaus. May our eyes be open. May we see the resurrected Christ. May we be fam- so familiar with his word and his voice that our hearts burn with passion. Jesus, we thank you for your word, Lord God. Lord, we thank you that the entire scripture, all scripture is God-breathed. All of it. Not just part of it, not the parts that we like, not the parts that make us uh, feel happy, Lord Jesus. All of it comes from your mouth to our ears. And so Jesus, right now, as I just said, Lord God, I pray, Lord, that we would be like the men on the road to Emmaus, that our hearts, God, would burn for passion, for you and for your word. And Lord, that you would open our eyes, open the eyes of our hearts, Lord Jesus, so that we would know you. We would see the resurrected Christ and like the men, that we would tell others, we have seen the resurrected Christ. We know the resurrected Christ because he lives in us. Jesus, we are nothing without you. And God, as we have seen this morning, Lord, your fingerprints are all over the scripture. Jesus, you are everywhere from Genesis to Revelation. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would just have a hunger for your word, that we would dig into your Bible, Jesus, and that you would just show us your your amazing power to transform lives. And that we would become more like your son. I just ask this in the name that is above every name, the name that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.